world thing. So seriously, I pray that you are divinely blessed. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, I have a word for you. And so we're going to worship uh, towards the end of our time together. And uh, we have a special worship session that I want to take you into. But first, I wanted to switch it up because this is a pastoral takeover. A pastoral takeover. A pastoral takeover. I'm taking over the whole thing like a hip hop artist. Can I get an amen? Holy hip hop artist. Does that work? I like it. I like it. All right. Here's the word. I want to start off in Genesis chapter 37. I'm telling you, you need to share this right now. I don't always tell you that, but I believe I have a word from the Lord that is really going to make sense out of a lot of the emotions that you have been feeling. Let me say it again. I believe I have a word that is going to make sense, provide clarity, provide a revelation, a new way to see things for a lot of the emotions that you've been feeling lately. So let's dive into this word. And I want you to know Peter did not walk on water. Peter walked on a word. You can take God's word to the bank. Can I get an amen? I already feel it. I'm preaching fire today. So much, so my sweatshirt was brown, but it turned red. Come on, somebody. (laughs) Genesis, I'm having too much fun here. Genesis chapter 37, verse three and four in the MSG version. Here we go. Israel The father loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he was the child of his old age. So to give a little context here, Israel had 12 children. Joseph was like the baby. He was the 11th of the 12. He was the the cute little booger. He was the baby. And Israel is being honest like none of you parents will be honest. He has a favorite. Now, some of you think this is impossible. It's because you don't have a bunch of kids. If you have 12 kids, you know good and well some of them are pure out rotten. They just get on your nerves. You know, some of those little booger noses, just the little kids you want to thump. Okay, but he loved Joseph. Now watch this. And he made him an elaborately embroidered coat. He, his opinion was that his 11th son, his 11th child, Joseph, was his favorite. He cared so much about showing his favoritism, his favor, that he made a coat of many colors, a different version says, and put it on him. He put his opinion on his son. When his brothers, when the family realized that their father loved him more than them, they grew to hate him. And all the middle children said, Amen. When, when, the, when they found out that Israel loved Joseph more, they do what every other brother and sister would do. They hated him. They wouldn't even speak to him. I want for a moment to bring you into the picture, the storyline. I want to bring you into the setting, if you will, of Joseph's life. Joseph has a very interesting life because Joseph did not decide to be the favorite. Joseph did not decide to have the favoritism of his father, but yet he wore it. And here we have Joseph starting off, if you read the book of Genesis chapter 37, this whole story is really 37 to 40, even all the way up to to chapter 50. But in chapter 37, we find him in the first part of that chapter, as a dreamer. He has these dreams that are given by God. And the whole storyline starts with this, this young man who was gifted, this young man who was a dreamer, this young man who had favor. And by the end of verse four, all of a sudden, all of that dream turned into a nightmare. All of the favor and the fact that all of these things are going to happen and God made me to lead the entire country in the middle of a famine. I mean, that is big stuff. Maybe you started this year with some big dreams. Maybe you felt like you had clarity about what God could do or what God would do in your life. But all of a sudden, unbeknownst to you, without warning, without a letter in the mail, without a text message, all of a sudden, favor turned into something else. Here in the story, if you read into chapter 37, you find that his whole family was divided around this. The moment Israel said, Joseph is my favorite, is the same moment that all of his brothers, all of his family hated him. We find in Joseph's story that he's betrayed. You ever been betrayed? We found out that, that Joseph was blocked. He wasn't invited to the party. He was People lied about him. People made up things. People created scenarios. His family even created scenarios to paint a certain picture about him and what had happened. We, as we go through different chapters of his story, we find out that Joseph is misunderstood. Had a dream, was favored by the Lord, but in this season, nobody understands him. We find him walking through things and doing the right thing and 
getting misjudged and saying the right things, but people somehow misconstrue it and misunderstand him and misappropriate what he said. And we actually find Joseph, this good guy that starts off in chapter 37 with this dream. We find him within a couple chapters in prison, check this out, for something he didn't even do. I don't know about you, but I don't know that any of us signed up for the pandemic. I don't know that any of us signed up for the culture that we feel in this world. I don't know that any of us signed up for social media so that we could get into social wars. I don't know that any of us signed up for any kind of life that looks like what is happening in our world. And I've got a feeling Joseph felt the same way. Everything started off with a dream, favored. He had a plan. But I've, I've heard it said before that the hardest punch to receive is not the punch you see. The hardest punch to receive is the one that you don't see. And I think I want to speak to the emotion that a lot of us feel right now. I want to speak today from the subject of I'm over it. Come on, would you say that with me? I am over it. I want you to think about something that has entered your life interruptedly and you just want to declare to it, I am over it. For some of you, you are pro-mask or some of you are anti-mask, but now you don't even care about the discussion anymore because you are, come on somebody, you are over it. For some of you, you got excited about the fact that you were going to spend more time with your kids and you bought all the Hot Pockets from Sam's and you were fired up to be the best parent in the world. You wrote two blogs, but you never posted them because let's be honest, you are over it. For some of you, you wanted to work at home. You had been begging your boss. I'll do whatever it takes. You can trust me. I will be efficient. I'll set up my own desk. I'll pay for all my desk. Just let me go to work at home so I can take care of my dog. I'll take care of you too. But you've been at home and you've been at home for two months and guess what? You're ready to go back to work because you are over it. I want to talk and I want to give what I believe the Lord has assigned me to give and help you understand this and help you see it, especially if, listen, if you are good to go, you can sign off this broadcast. If everything seems good to you, you have all the joy you need, you have all the hope you need, you have all the peace you need, you can sign off now. But I'm talking to some people who have some area or another where you just feel like you are flat out over it. In fact, that's what you've been saying. People will ask you your opinion and where you used to be opinionated, you are over it. Some people will ask you about your political side and you will now say things like, I have no clue. I am over it. I'm, I'm speaking to some people today who feel like they are over it. And as I step into the Bible where God speaks the loudest to all of us, when I, when I step into Genesis chapter 37 and I step into the, the story of Joseph, a man with a dream, who ended up seeing a season that felt a lot like division and divisiveness and dejection. When I look around into the cell of Joseph, I begin to see a lot of us. A lot of us that have <laughs> a lot of us that have been sent to a place we never wanted to go. We didn't sign up for it, we didn't want it, and we are just flat out over it. What's interesting is I begin to look into his story and say, my gosh, that feels like a pandemic. He, he, just, he was ridden off in the sunset of a destination he never signed up for. And he, by all accounts, is over it. I'm tired of being betrayed. I'm tired of being misunderstood. I'm tired of saying one thing and everybody thinks I said something else. I'm tired of everybody saying I got to say something about this and I don't even know about this and I got to say this and if I don't say this and I am just over it. What's interesting is the further I begin to look around in the prison cell of where Joseph lives and try to understand him so that we could better shepherd people who also feel like they're over it, I realized for years, for, for probably 20 years of studying this text, this storyline, I realized I missed something in the cell. I miss something in the setting of where Joseph is living, and I've got to show it to you because I think God today wants to make sense. I think he wants to give hope. I think he wants to let you see what God could be doing in the middle of a season that's forcing you to say, I am so over it. Come on, can we be honest? I just want before I before I give you this word, I've got to find out. Is there anybody else besides this dude in a red sweatshirt? Is there anybody else that feels like in one way or another you are just flat out over it? 
Come on, somebody. I know you're the only person in the room. Ain't nobody else in here. Is there anything that you are over? I'm talking to a cameraman. He's going, yes. He got his arms. He got his arms crossed. He's like, yeah. There are some things I am over. But I found something in the cell. I found something in the story that has helped me. And I believe it's going to help you. Let me take you a little bit to the middle of the story. To Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 and verse 2. Check this out. This is something I never saw about the season that Joseph was in. I could never make sense of it. I I asked all the questions that you were asking, like, why would this happen? Why would God allow this? Where is God in this? How can good things happen? How can bad things happen to good people? And how can no good thing happen to good people? Wow, God, where are, have you asked the question, God, where are you? What are you doing? Why would you allow this to come across your desk? Now watch this. Genesis chapter 39, verse 1 and 2, in the cell of Joseph. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt by the Ishmaelites. And Potiphar, an Egyptian leader, the head of the soldiers of Pharaoh's house, bought him from the Ishmaelites, sold into slavery. His brothers did not like the opinion of his father, so they sold him. It wasn't even Joseph's opinion. It was his dad's opinion. He gets blocked because of what somebody else said. I'm preaching now. But something I never saw. In the middle of being sold out, in the middle of being betrayed, the Lord was with him. It did not say the Lord saw him. It did not say from a distance he noticed him. It said the Lord was with him. Jump down to the last part of chapter 39. Another part of the story I never saw. He gets in prison, wrongfully in prison. So Joseph's boss took him and put him in prison. The place where the men who did wrong against the king were put into chains. So there he was in prison. Didn't do anything wrong. In prison. Just stuck. Chained. Didn't feel like you could talk anymore. Didn't feel like you had hope. Didn't feel like you could get out. Didn't feel like you had freedom anymore. Didn't feel like you had something that you could say without being criticized. Stuck in prison. Watch this. But the Lord was with Joseph. Every place that he was over it was a place where God was. The Bible says in Psalms chapter 37 that the steps of a person are ordered by God. I begin to ask the question, God, I'm so over it. How could you, how could you be involved in that? You were there? Come on. Anybody else want to? God, you, whoa, whoa, whoa. you were there? Then why didn't you do something about it? You, when I got in, when I got wrongfully accused and sent off and bought, you were there. Jesus, stop tripping. The end of verse thirty-nine. The boss wrongfully accuses me, puts me in pr- prison, and you were there. If you were there, why didn't you do anything? Come on, I'm talking to some real people today that you've had some real questions like, God, where are you? If you're really Emmanuel, what are you? doing and I begin to realize the further I dove into the scripture I would ask the spirit you were there what were you doing and I realized in the place where I'm over it the Lord is in it I'm over it but he's in it I'm talking to some people today who started this year off with a dream. You started this year off with some favor and you had a great idea and it has been derailed. You have been, unbeknownst to you, put in a place that you never wanted to be and you are over it and I'm here to bring you revelation. You may feel like you're over it, but God's in it. Come on, somebody. If I had an organ, I could say it a little better. If you feel like you're over it, check the setting. Look at the cell. Look from the pit to the prison of the palace. Wherever you're at, if you're over it, I'm here to tell you God is in it. God's in it. He's doing something. He's in it. When I'm over it, he's in it. When I think he's absent, he's not absent. He's present. God is doing something. When I'm over it, God's okay with you being over it. Perhaps it's okay to be over it. You say, J.D., what in the world are you talking about? How could God possibly be involved in a situation that pushes me to the brink of me, pushes me to the edge of my existence, pushes me to the edge of my faith, and makes me say, makes me feel, makes me want to embody things like I am just little. I'm done. I'm over it. Well, to understand this, you have to go back to the beginning of Joseph's life. 
Joseph had these dreams. He may have got a coat from his daddy, but he got, but he got a calling from God. And the calling was, Joseph, you're called to lead. Joseph, the entire country is going to go through something crazy and it's going to be a famine. It's going to be a t- pandemic and I need you to be able to lead. In fact, not just lead the nation, lead your family, the people that you are close to. You're going to have to be able to lead them. He said, now, why does that make any sense? Well, because you have to understand something about Joseph. Joseph was not the oldest boy. Joseph was not given a double portion. He was not the oldest son who had the ring from his father. No, 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 no. He was not first. He was not second. He was not third. He was not fourth. He was not eighth, ninth, or tenth. He was the eleventh boy. No way would he ever under any normal circle. I said norkel. Would he ever under, I can't believe I just said norkel. Check this out though. He would have never, never been allowed to lead if he was the eleventh his whole life growing up, he depended on his older siblings. They led him. If they told him to go do something, he did it. If they told him something was wrong, it was wrong. In fact, we even find out that a lot of his brothers and sisters would manipulate situations. I'm sorry, his brothers would manipulate situations and and they had been leading him his whole life. Do you know how hard it would be to direct people that you've been dependent on? Do you know how hard it would be for him to lead people that he needed? Let me say it this way. If he needed them, it would be very hard to lead them. If he needed their approval, if he needed their nod, if he needed their affirmation, if he needed their permission, it would be hard to lead. I think God allows us to go through seasons because I believe people like Joseph had to get over it in order to be over it. I'm about to preach this. Let me unpack this. I believe you don't earn the right to be over it until you are over it. You ever met somebody got that got the position and was so passionate and, and so persuaded and so given into the title and the position that they lost, lost the purpose of the whole job? If Joseph would have needed the affirmation of people in the palace or the affirmation of of his brothers, he would have never been able to lead them honestly because it's hard to lead somebody honestly if you need their affirmation. So God allowed him to get to a place where he was over it, over the need to please others, over the need to be affirmed and over the need to have everybody like every decision. God, in order for Joseph to be over it like he called him, he had to get to a place where he was over it. What am I saying? I'm saying God has a hand in putting us and allowing for us to go into situations where we are over it. Because, check this out, the end of me over it. I'm over it. I'm over. I'm so done. I'm over. I'm in prison. I don't belong here, but I need you to know that smells. That sounds an awful lot like surrender. Maybe, maybe the emotional response that finds its way into the words I'm over it. Maybe that's just our soul and our spirit saying, This is the end of me. I'm done with all of my preferences. I'm done with my need to control. I'm done with my need to have affirmation and everybody love everything. And I'm just, I'm going to stop living for the applause of men because I've learned that I'm over me. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. And God's going, yeah, yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's good. Are you really over it? Good. Are you really over it? That's good. That's exactly where I want you. Because if you're over it, I can use you. If you're over your preference, if you're over your opinion, if you're over your need to be right, baby, that's exactly where I want you. Because Joseph, if you never sat in a prison, you would never be able to govern in a way that it also works for the misfits and for the wrongly accused. And if you needed everything, Everybody to do everything right to you, you would not know how to lead people who have been mistreated.
Be careful that you run away from seasons where you get over it. No, over it is the address where we find surrender. I'm here to tell you, you can't be over it until you are over it. You want the position, but God's saying, until you are more in love with the purpose than the position, I got to take you through some things. I got to get you in a position where you are no longer paying allegiance to your needs and you are more about the vision of others. You are no no, no longer uh, aligned with your preferences, but you're thinking bigger than I've got to get you to a place where you can be over it. Jesus Christ himself was sent to the desert, and I believe God sends us to deserts so that we can rid ourselves of the allegiance to us. That's why. You feel over it? God's going, perfect. I got you where I want you because I can't use you if you're not surrendered. He's saying, if I can get you out of the way, I can do something there. If I can get your hot-headedness out of the way, I can do something there. If I can get your need to be right out of the way, I can do something there. Are you really over it? Are you really over it? If you are, you are at the address of where I can start doing things in your life. Look at the end of the story. Look what happens when he sits in the place where he is over it, but looks to God who is trying to do something. Check this out. Genesis chapter 50, the end of the story, verse 20. Joseph replied, don't be afraid. Do I act for God? Don't you see? Watch this. You planned evil against me. I didn't come up with this. I'm in a pandemic I didn't plan. You planned evil against me, but but watch this. But God used those same plans. God used those same plans. The thing I did not come went up with that took me to the end of me, to the place where I said I'm over it. God uses the desert. Listen to me. Do you feel over it? Good. Because that sounds like surrender. The thing you've been praying for is answered. Not in what side you take and how strong you are. It is answered in your surrender. Are you over it? Good. You need to be okay with over it. You say, well, I'm so over. Here's what you've been saying. I'm so over the division. The division I see, I see it everywhere. Everybody's dividing. Our world is so, uh, so, so polarized. I'm so over it. I'm so over these people versus these people. And it has to be this versus God saying, well, well, hold up. Are you really over it? Are you really over it? Are you over it enough to be more passionate about a purpose than your position? Are you really over it? Because if you're over it, I can make you over it. I can help you make a difference. If you are surrendered, I can help you serve it. You can't serve the mission if you are in love with your position. You can't serve the mission if you have not resigned your allegiance to you. You got to be over it to be used by God. Some of you have been saying, man, I'm so finished with everybody arguing. I'm over it. And God's going, hold up. Are you really? I see a, I see a heavenly smirk from heaven. I see God's like, whoa, 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 hold up. Are you really over the argumentative culture that we're living in? Are you really over seeing husband and wife not talk to each other? Are you really over seeing neighbors build higher fences because they disagree? Are you really over it? Perfect. Because if you will die to your need to be right, we can reconcile it. See, because some of us have been taught that reconciliation comes from our reaction and our responses and our stances. But last time I checked, God always uses relationships to reconcile. Joseph, if you can ever get over it, you can be over it. What is God saying? God's saying, if I can ever get you out of the way, I can use you. This is not a feel-good message, I understand, but hopefully it's clarifying. Because I know there's areas of my life where I'm just like, man, I am over it. And what I hear the Spirit of God saying is, oh, that smells good. There's a sweet incense of surrender in your I'm over it. What is God doing? He's bringing His people who are supposed to be agents of change to a place of surrender so that he can actually use us. Some of you want peace, but you're too opinionated. You're too interested in being hurt. Some of you want a great marriage, but you're too selfish. Oh, that hurts, doesn't it? Some of you want to be great parents to your kids, but you still want to be their best buddy 
and you want them to affirm and like, and you don't want to make them bad. But sometimes in order to lead, you have to, you have to lead your kids in a way that's right that they don't agree with. But if I need them to always love it, I'll never lead them because if I need it, I can't lead it until I get over their need of affirmation. I can't lead them in the right way. Some of you want to be influential on social media, but God wants you to get over it because until you don't need their affirmation, you are not going to be responsible enough to lead the way socially. Because if you need their opinion, you won't be bold enough to tell the truth. I'm over it. Come on, somebody say, I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm over it. I'm, oh, I'm done with this. You know what God's saying? I've got you exactly where I want you. If you resonate with this, if you are over it, congratulations. You are finally at a place where God can use you. Come on. This is revelation. This is understanding that at the end of you is the beginning of what God could do through you. Look, look at the imagery. Look at what God did. You say, well, when God was trying to win the disagreement, the war, the argument between good or evil, did he send down an opinion? Did he send down a post? Did he send down an argument or a debate? No. Why? Because reconciliation doesn't come from your response. What did God send down? A relationship. Because we get to reconciliation through relationship. And until we surrender our need to be right, we cannot be part of the solution. You even see this in Jesus' life. Think about it. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's kneeling down, feeling the weight of this war, the weight of good versus evil, a serious war. And he experiences hematidrosis, blood. He has so much anxiety, so much hurt, that he has a very rare instance where he has hematidrosis. Blood starts coming from his vessels. And you know what he says? God, man, if there's an, I'm over this. If, 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 if it's okay with you, if it's okay, I mean, it's all about you, but if, if it's okay, I'm just, I, I don't know if I can, I'm over this. And you know what I hear God saying? Perfect. Jesus, now that you're over it, you can be over it. I'm going to let you lead the whole thing because in your sacrifice, the world will be saved. Listen to me, people who profess to be Christians or, or followers of Christ. Until you surrender, you cannot be part of the solution. I'm over it, man. I'm so done. I'm over it. God's going, yes, good, good. Stop running away from the cell. Stay there for a minute. Be okay with it. Don't wipe the tears away too soon because it sounds like surrender. It smells like the surrender that I need to use you. If you will ever surrender, I can use you. You can't be over it until you are over it. And so today, I just, I want to congratulate you if you're one of the very few that I'm talking to, even if it's just one person and you say, you know what? I'm so over this. Congratulations. You are at the place. You are at the turning point. Because if you want to see peace, you've probably had arrived at a place where your opinion and being right matters less. And now you can lead us toward, towards peace. You want to see your marriage restored, but you're just over it, done arguing. You're probably just now at a place where you're more interested in listening and serving than being right. You want to be a great parent. You want to be a great friend, but there's just some things that have rubbed you the way and you're just over it. Congratulations. You are at the perfect place where God can use you. One verse in the New Testament says, I must decrease so that he can increase. And every time I've found the increase of God in my life, it is right after my surrender. My, I'm, I'm over it. And so I want to encourage you today. I want you to leave this broadcast. I want you to share. If this means something to you, I want you to share this because there's a lot of people trying to make sense of, I'm, I'm just into my rope. I'm over it. And I'm, I'm letting you know that God wants you to lead the change, but you can't be over it until you are 
over it. Come on, make some noise. Give me some emojis if this is ministering. Aren't you thankful that God's Word speaks to us in every single season? Come on, some of you have been saying I'm over it, and I'm letting you know right here now that's because God wants you to be over it. Some of you are in the prison, and you're going, God, what in the world am I going to do? I'm so over this, and God's going, yeah, that's because I had to send you there so that you could lead better and make a difference and make change in the world. You're over it. You're over it. You're an overcomer. I'm sending you to that situation because I'm refining you. I'm doing something. You're going to be over this. If you can ever get over it, you can be over it in the mighty name of Jesus. Do you believe that? Amen. I'm fired up. And here's what I know. I know there are some people under the sound of my voice that when you think about your life, when you think about the sin, that's anything that's less than perfection with God. That's It literally means I'm, I missed the mark. And some of you feel like I'm just the sin, the shame, the guilt, the things I've done during this quarantine, the things I've done in my life, the things that have been done to me, I'm just, I'm just over it. I'm overcome with all of it. And God's going, are you really? Are you really over it? Because that's the perfect place where I can give you victory over it. Are you over the sin? Then I can give you victory over it. And that's what salvation is. It's putting my faith in Jesus who has victory. He's over it. He has power over your sin, power to forgive, power for you to walk in victory. You don't have to commit the same mistakes. God can help you walk over the water and the storms of your life, but it starts with surrender. My salvation did not happen. My relationship with Jesus didn't happen because of a post I made or because of my position. It happened and I'm, I'm over it. I'm, I'm done of me trying to lead me. And some of you know what you need? A fresh start and some of you need a new start. Of saying, you know what, Jesus, I surrender. I'm, I'm over it. God wants you to be an overcomer, but it starts with, I'm just, I'm over. I'm over trying to lead me. And I, and I need, I need Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. If that's you, I want to say a prayer. If you need a restart, listen to me. Some of you have known about Jesus for a long time. But some of you, you have just, you feel like your life is misaligned. And, and you're just over some things. And you need this moment of surrender to reestablish your relationship with Jesus. And so I'm going to say a prayer. And I want everybody that's watching, don't check out of this. Check into this moment where the presence of God is coming into your room. And in this sweet moment of I'm over it, in this sweet moment of surrender, I believe God is going to be able to start breaking the chains of your life. I see the prison door opening and you walking to the freedom and to the purpose that God has for you. Would you say this prayer with me? Dear Jesus, step into my life. I surrender. I surrender everything to you. I give you my life. I'm over it. You can have it. Come into my life. I repent of my sin. I'm going a different way. Just tell them that I repent of my sin. For some of you, you need to reestablish your alignment with God. Reestablish your allegiance, not to your preference, not to your position, but to your Savior, Jesus. And just tell him, God, I'm realigning with you. God, I'm going after you. God, I'm serving you. God, I'm serving an audience. I'm, I'm worshiping. I'm living for an audience of one Jesus Christ. Come into my life and save me in the mighty name of Jesus. I know many of you just gave your life to Christ and you need to click that button or let us know. Click the button that says I raise my hand, but here's what I want to do. You know what worship is? Worship is a sign and an act of surrender. And this is why it's conducive for you to stand up from wherever you're at. I know some of you have been doing this so long that you started off worshiping in these moments and all of a sudden now you've just been sitting and listening and watching. I'm just going to ask you to go back to some fresh love, some like, like you've never done this before. And I'm, I want to take you back to a moment where we could have, well, back then where we could have 50, 60, 70 people in the room. And I want to take you into a worshipful moment to remind you that Jesus is all that you need. Let's embrace this moment of surrender. Let's worship Jesus. You feel over it? This is your moment. Love it all. You bowed it all. No one before you. You're above all our fears, Lord. Above all anxiety, you've already conquered. You're the God above the storm. You're the 
guarded by the storm of the sea. You're the God above the seas. You're the God above the seas. Sing that again. You're the God above the storms. You're the God above the storms. You're the God above the seas. Caught up in the moment, I'm caught up in your peace. You've already won the battle, already overcome. I'm not caught up in the moment, I'm caught up in your love. You're the God of the storm, you're the God of the disease. I'm not caught up in the moment. Heart of the peace, you've already won the battle, already overcome. I'm caught up in the moment, I'm caught up in love. You're the God of the storm, you're the God of the disease. I'm not caught up in the moment, I'm caught up in the Already overcome. I'm not caught up in the moment. Come on, last time let's sing. You're the God above the storm. You're the God above the seas. I'm not caught up in this moment. I'm caught up in your peace. You've already won the battle. Already overcome.
you have all my attention you have all my attention you have all my praise you get all of my praise I'll stand here with my hands lifted oh completely surrender to your ways you have all my attention you have all my attentions You get all of my praise yeah. I'll stand here with my hands lifted Oh, completely surrender to you Sing the name Oh, Jesus, I'll never get over you Father, we thank you that when we feel over it, we are reminded in Scripture that you are up to something, that your hand is in the middle of our atmosphere, the place where we are, and you're driving us, you are leading us towards surrender. Jesus, we'll never get over you. We'll never get past you. Jesus, the, today is a fresh surrender to you. We love you. We love you. We love you. Come on, somebody, just tell them, God, I love you. I'm thankful for you. I'll never get over you. I freshly surrender my life to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Well, listen, thank you so much. I know today was a little different. I just felt like a pastoral takeover. And I hope those of you that feel like you are over it will share this with some friends who feel like they're just over it. And I hope that the word of God will speak to them exactly where they are. I want you to stay tuned because our team has been working around the clock and we have a massive announcement that we will unleash next weekend. It is a plan for our gatherings. There needs to be a seven day drum roll until next Sunday. Tell your friends, tell your mom, tell your cousin, tell your neighbor, tell somebody. Next week, we're gonna announce the beginning of our plans to gather. Hey church, you know what to do. Don't, don't act like you don't know what to do. Let's go out. Let's love God, love people, and enjoy life.